<clears throat> I almost became a Rochesterian. Uh, back in my high school days, I applied to the University of Rochester for admission, and I was accepted. However, I chose to go to Tufts in the Boston area. <clears throat> um, but there's, um, New Rochester has a very interesting history. Um, because um, there was a famous case in 1948 by the uh, McCollum family, Vashti McCollum lived in uh, Urbana-Champaign in Illinois, and she had a three sons, but the middle son, Jim, um, it was a very difficult time as she challenged the issue of uh, release time, uh, religious intrusion into the public schools, and so Jim was sent to stay with his maternal grandmother, grandparents, uh, the, Mac the Cromwell, Cromwell, um, here in Rochester, and uh, New York has had another interesting history because there was a time, there was a 1962 Supreme Court decision known as Engel versus Vitale. Um, Engel was a, a Long Island resident, and he and three other uh, families challenged the New York Board of Regents prayer, which is a very innocuous thing that said uh, it was composed by a committee of uh, clerics at the request of the Board of Regents. A very innocuous, almighty God, we ask our dependence, uh, your blessings upon us, blah, blah, blah. But they challenged this in the Supreme Court and won. Um, that was a, 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 an important precursor to the case that we'll talk about tonight. And uh, there's a very memorable phrase that comes from the annual decision that I'm very fond of, phrase, of, uh, of quoting, and I ask for all of you to remember it. It said, it is no part of the business of government to be composing prayers. I think that's an extremely succinct summary of the whole issue. It forces us to think, what is the proper business of government? The proper business of government has to do with repairing roads and civic um, duties and, um, and improving the lives of the, of the citizens of the community. Composing prayers, having prayers, is no part of the business of government. Well, and today everybody, of course, knows about the town of Greece, and uh, everybody here knows, and it's a, it's a great threat that the Supreme Court, uh, in the present constellation of justices, could undo many years of the of Establishment Clause decisions. Well, I'm happy here to, to be here in the company of skeptics, and heretics, and apostatizers, <laughs> non theists, <laughs> non believers. And Jews. And Jews. <laughs> <laughs> And I hope none of you are blasphemers, because that would be going too far. <laughs> um, but before we go on, may I suggest, let us pray. Well, maybe not. I tend to expect nervous giggles. But isn't that an evocative phrase? Almost instinctively, we respond. It's like picking up a kitten or a puppy by the scruff of the neck. It makes us compliant and content. But we need to think about what we pray for. In high school, students are not noted for um, praying to lofty ideals, um, and so praying to have a date with that cute little girl in the back of the, uh, the third row might be an important thing to pray about. Maybe pre people pray about even raunchier things, who knows? I never tried out for a beauty pageant, so I never had to pray for world peace. <laughs> Last autumn, Americans United gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award, which I very greatly appreciate. But I think it a bit odd, because the only thing I really achieved was to get the ACLU and my family involved way back in 1956, 1957, and 1958. I haven't done so much to deserve awards. It turns out that if you live to be 73, something you did in high school might get remembered. And some things I did in high school I hope are not remembered. <laughs> There have been many cases, Engel that I mentioned, the Lemon case, Weissman, Gold, Griswold. Plaintiffs did not continue to speak out, so my real achievement was to keep in touch and be active and supportive, and to live for 50 years after the Supreme Court decision, and to encourage younger generations to be involved. I do have a slight claim to fame. I have been denounced, been denounced publicly by Ted Cruz. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Awards mean to me remembering on behalf of my mother and father, Edward and Sydney, and my brother Roger and sister Donna. Without my parents' support, nothing would have happened, and I would have been just another troubled teenager. Awards go to them, as I do my best to carry on their wishes and legacy. Well, I was born in Philadelphia, and I do want to honor my mother. I was born just once. My mother was actually there, and she had no intention of having me born again. <laughs> She also rejected having me baptized against the wishes of the paternal side, so I am here unbaptized and unwashed in any blood. I can wait for a stampede to the exits. <laughs> the family history says I was a cute baby, 
I guess the demonic, satanic features came later. <laughs> and I do accept awards on behalf of the ACLU and their attorney, Henry Sawyer. Without the help of the ACLU, there could have been no case. And there almost wasn't. The ACLU in Philadelphia had many reservations back in 1956 and 58. This was in the waning days of the McCarthy era, and there were many considerations. There was a wonderful book written by Stephen Solomon, a professor at NYU, called Ellery's Protest, which I highly recommend to you. Um, I learned a lot of things by reading it. I didn't choose the title, and I won't get a nickel from it, but you could buy it for 13 bucks on Amazon, I think, thereabouts. So it's, it, for those of you who'd like to know more about the case, this is really an excellently written book. <coughs> Henry Sawyer, our lawyer, was a remarkable man working at Drinker, Bibble, and Roth, a well-known law firm in Philadelphia. He spent a year researching, thinking, and constructing arguments to present our case, all pro bono, and he proved to be very skilled in examination and cross-examination. So I accept awards posthumously for Henry Sawyer. There may be lawyers here, and they know full well that plaintiffs do not win cases. Lawyers win cases. It's long bothered me that this case is known as Abington, Shem, and Murray. The proper attribution is to Henry Sawyer. And some may not know, actually, that it was Henry Sawyer who, a few years later, argued what became known as the Lemon Case, resulting in the famous Lemon Test. So he's a real hero of separation of church and state, and he deserves all the applause. I mentioned Murray, that is, Madeline Murray O'Hare. She brought an almost identical case in Maryland about Bible readings and prayers. The Abington case was first heard in Federal District Court in, on August 5th in 1958. I remember it well, because it was my 18th birthday. If some of you have birthdays, I recommend choosing court dates to coincide. <laughs> <laughs> Murray's case started two years later in 1960. The Supreme Court they reached the Supreme Court by accident at the same time, and the court then consolidated or joined the two cases. So the full title of the case is known as Abington versus Shemp and Murray versus Curl. Murray was an outspoken atheist and a very colorful figure. She founded the modern atheist movement, American Atheist. Sadly, she was brutally murdered in 1996, together with her son Garth and granddaughter Robin. So part of my legacy is to remember Madeline Murray and her contributions to the separation of church and state from an atheist, non-theist perspective. And it's also nice and important to remember pioneers who went before. Vashti McCollum in Illinois that I already mentioned, Steve Engel and Roth in New York, and, the, <clears throat> and uh, I already mentioned that wonderful phrase from Engel, it is no part of the business of government to be composing prayers. And after the Abington decision, there were the Griswold case about contraceptions in 1965, Epperson <coughs> versus Arkansas, and, uh, and Lemon versus Kurtzman, um, well, uh, Epperson and Edwards versus Grillard having to do with evolution versus creationism, um, Lee versus Weissman having to do with graduation prayers, um, Glassruth versus Moore in 2010, two, a famous case about uh, this crazy Supreme Court justice who insisted upon this granite monument of the Ten Commandments. So prayers at graduation, prayers at football games, there are about, I can't remember, maybe 12, 13, 15 cases that have come after uh, the Abington case that all have affirmed the basic principle and expanded it in some areas. And there are present day uh, uh, pioneers. There are young people like Jessica Alquist, who was, um, was a high school student in Cranston, Rhode Island, and saw a so-called prayer banner on the wall and complained about it as a atheist and non-believer. Uh, and that case we eventually uh, went to court and the court insisted that the prayer banner was a, uh, an infringement on the Establishment Clause and had to be taken down. Matthew LeClaire in New Jersey who complained about a history teacher who constantly was inserting a Christian evangelical uh, commentary in his history lessons. Josh Damon in Louisiana who also insisted upon um, teaching evolution instead of creationism. There's an organization that I highly recommend called the Secular Students Alliance. Secular students have been, um, set up or have helped establish chapters in something in the neighborhood of 450 colleges and universities around the country, and they represent a refuge, if you wish, from the Christian crusade and other uh, uh, evangelical groups on campuses and keep alive the idea of humanists and skeptics and non-believers and atheists. Um, perhaps I inspired them, you might think. Well, no. Jessica Alquist, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, was on a panel with me last year, and she suddenly blurted out, I had no idea who you are and that my court case relied on your case. <laughs> so it is easy to be famous and totally unknown. <laughs> the Pennsylvania ACLU had a nice remembrance last year. I met a man named Shannon Turk. 
His family moved to Butler, Pennsylvania, north of Pittsburgh, from someplace in the West, and he was promptly enrolled in public school there. He had never been part of morning devotions or reciting the Lord's Prayer, so he was initially baffled and didn't recite it. The teacher called him to the front of the class, forced him to bend over, and paddled him. Now, Dirk was a, Turk was a determined young man, and for the next two years, every day, he was paddled in front of the class. When he told his story, he embraced me with tears in his eyes, because one day, in 1963, the paddling stopped. This brutality and humiliation in the name of religion affirms that school-required religious exercises were a darn good thing to be stopped. Countless people over the years have told me how unpleasant it was for them at morning devotions. But a few weeks ago, Eileen and I stopped at the Mystic Lakes, a park near where we, where we live, and the car parked next to us had a sticker on the rear window. Since the Bible was taken out of the schools, our country has been in moral decline. Well, I'm sure this is by divine intent or divine coincidence that we happened to park next to him. <laughs> I wanted to leave a note on his windshield, but Arlene didn't want me. <laughs> but what does this guy mean by moral decline? We have civil rights for African Americans. We have pensions and rights for our senior citizens. We have recognized rights for our LGBT community. We have established rights for women to choose their own paths in having a baby. We no longer have anti-Jewish covenants and discriminations in public housing and many other places. And gasp, <laughs> my God, we even allow people to live together without benefit of clergy. <laughs> so the notion that our country has gone to hell in a handbasket since Bible reading and prayers stopped is very popular, and I think very wrong. Looking back on my life, I, the seeds of my protest had several roots. I love science and nature. From second or third grade, I was fascinated by the solar system and learned all the planets, their distances from the sun, their diameters. But <clears throat> the idea that the Earth was very old, that much had happened before I and we arrived, made a deep impression on me. My love of science and scientific understandings was always present. My family attended the Unitarian Church in Germantown, part of Philadelphia, and this was seminal. In addition to the usual Bible stories in Sunday school, we learned about other religions, and I quickly assimilated the idea that there was no single truth, and any claim that God spoke to some but not to others was ridiculous. I started thinking about the Constitution and the Bible way back in 1956, when I was a 16-year-old junior at the Abington Senior High School in a suburb of Philadelphia. And the law said that uh, there was a Pennsylvania law that required 10 verses of the Bible to be read in every school classroom at the beginning of each school day without comment. This was followed by the students standing to recite the Lord's Prayer and then the flag salute. 20 or 30 states had similar laws. The practice was called morning devotions, so the religious intent was obvious. It seemed to me that this was a violation of the First Amendment because it clearly established a Christian religious practice in the schools under the authority of the teachers and the government. I read the First Amendment several times. It is only 45 words long, so it's not taxing even for teenagers. <laughs> I brought a copy of the Koran to school. I did this because I wanted to show that the Bible was not the only source of truth, not the only holy book. The Koran was merely by accident, because one of my friend's fathers had a copy of it in his library. It could have been the Buddhist scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, or Shia Shinto scriptures. Though so I read this to myself, um, not making a fuss on it, but I did not stand for the Lord's Prayer, and the print homeroom teacher immediately accosted me and um, demanded to know what was going on, and I replied that as a matter of conscience, I no longer felt I, I could participate in these morning devotions. I was sent to the principal, who lectured me on respect and the school rules. I replied that I was concerned for respect for the Constitution and freedom of conscience. He sent me to the guidance counselor. <laughs> who insisted upon knowing, was I having problems at home? Or was I getting along well with my dad? No, I said, I, I think they would agree with me. Uh, but I just disagreed with Bible reading and prayer. <clears throat> well, that evening I came home and reported on the day's events to my family at dinner time that my father suggested that I write a letter to the ACLU in Philadelphia. <clears throat> a copy of this letter was oddly enough found in the National Archives by Stephen Solomon when he was writing this book. <clears throat> November 26, 1956. Gentlemen, as a student in my junior year at Abington Senior High School, I would very greatly appreciate any information that you might send regarding possible union action and or aid in testing the constitutionality of Pennsylvania law, which arbitrarily and seemingly unrighteously and unconstitutionally compels the Bible to be read in our public school system. 
I thank you for any help you might offer in freeing American youth in Pennsylvania from this gross violation of the religious rights as guaranteed in the first and foremost amendment of our United States Constitution. Sincerely yours, Ellery F. Shemp. Well, speaking for American youth was rather pretentious, indeed. I was 16 years old then, and since then I've learned to write shorter sentences. <laughs> I also enclosed a $10 bill. I think that's worth about $100 in today's money, and this got their attention. If a kid can save this sum from his allowance in grass cutting, he must be serious. I typed this out on my dad's typewriter. You remember typewriters? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I think this is the major generational divide. It's not whether you're baby boomers or millennials, it's whether you remember typewriters or not. <clears throat> well, memory is going back to the 1954-1963 era. We were in the midst of the McCarthy era in 1954, when every dissent was labeled communist or worse. But the Supreme Court in 54 had decided that segregation was a violation of the Constitution, which I thought was a wonderful affirmation of human rights and social justice. This influenced me to think that this applies to religious minorities, although at the time I had no idea that my objections would reach the Supreme Court. In 1954, the phrase under God was added to the pledge. It's quite amazing. None of our founding fathers ever recited the Pledge of Allegiance, nor did Abraham Lincoln. It was only written in 1892 by Francis Bellamy, a minister with socialist leanings. And it only became widely known after World War I. When I hear that under God is essential to our well-being, I ask, how could it be that the United States survived for 100 years without this pledge? As I mentioned, the phrase under God was only added in 54 at the urging of the Knights of Columbus, a Catholic group that favors Vatican-based government. The entire Congress marched out to the Capitol steps to recite the new pledge while singing Onward Christian Soldiers. This influenced me a good bit. I looked it up on a map. We are not under God, we're actually under Canada. <laughs> <coughs> and in 1955, Playboy published its first issue. Now, as a teenage scholarly lad, I had little interest, except for the articles. But I, <laughs> but I noticed that the Bible thumpers were outraged and wanted to stop it. I felt it my civic duty to stand up for Playboy. I mean, in a conflict between the Bible and the Playboy, there couldn't be any discussion. <laughs> Well, in 1958, I went off to Tufts. I did not know when I applied to colleges that, the that our, my high school principal, Stull, had included a letter of disrecommendation in all my applications. <laughs> I went to, uh, I, CBS called me for an interview, and I went to Dean Stearns and asked if there was something I should know. And he told me that after my application was accepted, the principal called long distance. The long distance was rare and expensive in 1954, 58 to demand him to rescind my admission, that I was a rotten apple and would bring disrepute to Tufts. Stearns told me that Stoll's call was the most amazing he'd ever received as dean of admissions. <clears throat> but it was kind of him to say that Tufts never regretted my decision. In 2002, um, I was actually admitted to Abington High School Hall of Fame. Um, it was rather nice of them, and the uh, teacher who was in charge of this program um, called me up and said that I was going to be honored for my contributions to science. And not to mention uh, the many contributions to constitutional law, um, social justice, or anything else. But he was very nice to say, look, in your acceptance speech, you can say anything you like. <laughs> but in 1956 to 1960, in that era, there were no atheist organizations, not even American Humanists, not even Americans United. No secular did exist in the form of called Protestant and others united for separation of church and state, but it's a very different organization. There was no stu secular student alliance, no Freedom from Religion Foundation, so it was only the ACLU I could turn to for help. This was a time even before the internet, if you can believe it. 1963, 50 years ago, many other things were happening in 63. It's nice to remember it for a footnote in history. Separation, in the state, uh, separation of church and state was in the news for a few days, but other events quickly eclipsed it. I mean, there were the Beatles. And George Wallace was sworn in as governor of Alabama, pledging segregation now, segregation forever. <clears throat> so on June 17th, the Supreme Court ruled against Bible reading and prayer in the public schools. But on July 1st, the United States Postal Service instituted the zip code system. Do you remember? And on July 25th, the U.S. and the Soviet Union and England signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. 
On August 28th, 63, Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. <clears throat> 19, on November 18th, Bell Telephone introduced the push button telephone. Okay. November 22nd, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So what little thing I started in the ACLU with Henry Sawyer sort of dims in contrast. But separation of church and state remains a key concept. One of my motivations was the sense of fairness. I thought that schools needed to be fair to everyone. The Bible is not the holy book of Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, so that is an unfairness. Non-believers going to school to learn history and math should not have the Bible or, uh, or prayer forced on them. I remember my Jewish friends were made uncomfortable by certain passages that tended to be read at Easter time and Christmas time. And I remember that the Catholic kids did not say the same version of the Lord's Prayer. And in fact, the Bible that was provided was the King James Version of, uh, it was called the Holy Bible, but in fact, it turned out to be the King James Version. But many people do not know that the Catholics have a different Bible. It's called the Douay Rhymes Bible. It's quite a different translation. And it has different books even, different numbering of the Ten Commandments, different many, many things. And the Old Testament, which is 80% of the New Testament, we yes. call it, if you look, it's 80% what they call the Old Testament. And if you compare that with the Jewish Bible, there's a lot of inconsistency. Exactly. You know. So the, the idea that there is a Bible is wrong by, its, by it itself. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I rejected the notion that there was one universal truth. I saw that the school, however, was acting as a missionary for one sectarian Christian belief, trying to suppress other beliefs. The important idea here is that one size in religion does not fit all. And by the way, there's a little binder that my partner Arlene has put together that has some memorability. I think it's so circulating around the room, so uh, that has a copy of the letter that I wrote to the ACLU and some pictures of the family and various things, so take a look at it. So if the Bible is really the word of God, we have to ask, how come there are so many different versions? It seems to me obvious that the Bible is not the source of morality as the school claimed. I mean, I got to thinking, which is always a bit dangerous. I knew that kids in Oregon and other states did not have Bible reading. Most of the Western states did not have these religious observances in the school. So could it be true that the kids in Oregon and Washington were less moral than those of us in Abington? This question brought out the lie. And the Bible contains passages that are in direct contradiction to science. I mean, scientifically, it's impossible to believe in Noah's flood. This is a story with no moral or scientific value. There are so many accounts of creation in various traditions, so the Genesis account of Noah's, of, and Noah's flood myths are simply one among many. I rejected the idea that the Bible account has any authority. I used to disbelieve in talking snakes, too, but then Glenn Beck and Sarah Palin came along. <laughs> And it's important to recognize that rituals imposed on seven-year-olds are an unfairness. In the Abington decision, the court recognized that children are particularly vulnerable and deserve particular protection for their developing thoughts and their freedoms of beliefs without coercion from a majority or dominant religious faith. Anyone who's seen a class of second graders, you know they will say anything. They stand up, they mumble, they've done their duty. Being excused from, class particip from participation in these religious exercises is not an effective answer because it requires a child to self-identify as a dissenter or a non-believer and opens the door to discrimination, taunting, and bullying. An important phrase from the Abington decision was, um, to, was to affirm that coercion may be subtle. The phrase they wrote in the court decision was, and this is neat, children are not noted for their resistance to the forces of social suasion. So the Supreme Court decision in June 17th changed the laws in about 32 <coughs> states. Bible reading as a devotional ceremonial practice stopped. It was an eight to one decision. When you think about all the five to four, six to three decisions we know about today, it was significant that this was joined in concurring opinions by both liberal and conservative justices and by justices who were Jewish, Protestant, and Catholic. So this was very broadly based, not in any way judicial activism. Potter Stewart was the lone dissenter. Tom Clark and Harlan, the leading conservatives on the court, were in the majority, joined by Chief Justice Earl Warren. Steve Solomon's book, which I highly recommend, gives much interesting background and details of all this. Well, there was a reaction. This made national news. There was outrage on a grand scale. You might say it was of biblical proportions. <laughs> 
I have a lot of cousins, and suddenly every one of them had an identity crisis. Can we change our names? <laughs> oh, that's my crazy uncle. No, those are some other champs, never heard of them. <laughs> but President Kennedy made a nice statement to calm the country. He said, I'm sure we can all pray a little more in our homes, our churches, and our synagogues. And there's a wonderful cartoonist named Herblock for the Washington Post, who summed up the whole issue, I think, in a very succinct cartoon. Um, so it was a man blustering, holding the newspaper with the headline, Supreme Court ruling, shouting at the uh, children, and what do they, what do they expect us to do? Listen to the children play at, pray at home? <laughs> well, precisely. <laughs> Earl Warren had been a target of the John Birch Society for several years, but now billboards redoubled, impeach Earl Warren. You may actually know that the Tea Party and the Koch brothers are actually descendants of the John Birch Society. We received about 5,000 letters, roughly one-third supporting us, one-third opposing in what you might call uh, reasonable terms, and one-third, of course, were hateful and vituperative. Several of the letters in support mentioned the, the chapter in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 6, about not praying for public display, as the hypocrites do, seeking public approval, and not using vain repetitions, as the heathen do. That was kind of neat. My parents answered every letter with a return address. This was in the days before Xerox machines and when stamps cost three and a half cents. Still came to hundreds of dollars. The interesting thing was that we were accused of being everything the writer hated. So you expected one of these uh, letters that said, hey, what are you, commies? What are you, Nazis? What are you, Catholics? What are you, Jews? We didn't expect the one that said, what are you, Presbyterians? <laughs> <laughs> and then, then, of course, there were the letters that said, in the name of Christ, go to hell. <laughs> Some of those paper pictures smeared with extra money, however. I don't recall any letter that accusingly asked, what are you, Zoroastrians? I conclude that nobody hates Zoroastrians, and you might want to look into it. <laughs> One of the things that was easy to learn was that it was bad not to be Christian. It was, of course, very bad to be a communist. But it was really quite awful to be an atheist. When people called us, you communist atheists, they had reached their ultimate in outrage. Atheists were then, and still are, the most hated and feared group in America. Fear and hate usually go hand in hand. As I said, hate and fear are intimately related. Fear is a primal emotion. Fears of many kinds can overtake us. Some are realistic, many are exaggerated. But when these fear brain centers are activated, all the others stop working. So it is that religious demagogues appeal to our fear centers. Our family suffered relatively little, especially in comparison to what the Murray family had to endure. Dog poo was thrown on our steps. Kids in the school bus rolled down their windows and shouted, now passing the commie camp, when passing our home. Roger was knocked around several times, which hurts, and Donna was mortified. Some parents told their daughters not to play with Donna. Well, I'll make a short diversion here about the Constitution and the Bible. But let me tell you, there is nothing in the Constitution about the Bible, and there is nothing in the Bible about democracy or our Constitution. A lot of people assume that there is some connection between the Bible and our Constitution. But our Constitution never once mentions God, or Christianity, or any commandments. It is a purely humanistic document. The preamble begins, we the people do ordain and establish. The Constitution mentions religion just twice. And both times, the word no is attached. <laughs> the first mention is in Article 6. No religious test shall be required for public office. The second time, of course, is in the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The Constitution is a purely humanistic, religiously neutral, secular, and political document. No delegate at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia thought the idea of free voting by common people came from divine revelation. That is, of course, free voting by white property men. Some people think it was divine that women and blacks were not allowed to vote. It is significant that the Constitution does not call for any worship or ask for any divine blessings or providence by, by, by providence. The Constitution's oath for taking office does not contain the phrase, so help me God. This phrase has been appended by various oath takers, probably for a political spin. The writers of the Constitution were, in fact, very careful to, to distinguish between an oath versus affirmation. You know the phrase, I do swear or affirm. The reason that was put in the Constitution in that form was that swearing to an oath, especially in 1790 or thereabouts, 
um, had definite religious connotations, oath swearing, con religious connotations. To affirm was an, to, to assure freedom from religion. <coughs> and the Bible, by contrast, never once mentions democracy. The Bible never mentions freedom of speech or freedom of religion. The Bible does not mention checks and balances and limitations on the power of the executive or an independent judicial branch. The Bible does not mention elections or voting. The Bible does not even mention tolerance for other believers, much less non-believers. And there are more than 200 denominations in the United States alone, and each claims to have the one true faith. The sheer number of such claims makes it difficult to believe any one of them. The Bible provides no model for good government or for personal freedoms. The Bible is a purely religious and theological document for some believers. The commandments, that is 10, well actually if you go to Google and type in 613 commandments, you will find that there are actually 613 commandments um, in the Old Testament. They do not represent American society. So it's very important to understand. We are not a Christian nation. We are not a Judeo-Christian nation. We are a constitutional nation. And let me add a phrase, a, a comment here about the Declaration of Independence. It is a poetic document intended to stir emotions and to override the prevalent notion of the divine right of kings. This is a talk in itself, but I want to say that the Declaration of Independence is equally for religious independence as for political independence. The main point is that the Declaration is not any part of the Constitution and no part of our laws. Not a single legal decision by the Supreme Court is based on the Declaration of Independence. The phrase, our rights come from our creator, is humanistic in its intent. And if religious at all, then it is deistic, not evangelical Christian. The phrase was to emphasize the rights of the common man, the common woman, over the kingship class. I mentioned our founding fathers of our Constitution. There were also founding mothers, but mothers never even got the right to vote until 1920. I do have to mention sex. This usually wakes up an audience. Religious groups often talk about morality. They think ethical values are important, and I do too. But when religious types talk about morality, they actually mean only sex. Much of the Bible, as, is, as, as it is worshipped, has to do only with sex. Our priests, pastors, preachers seem obsessed with who has orgasms, alone or with whom. I mean, this is quite weird. Why on God's green earth would churches be worried about sex and orgasms? The answer is about control. It turns out that sex is quite popular, and probably more popular than preachers, so this is a threat. Of course, the idea that you can have fun, but others should not, is the underlying theme in evangel evangelists. Of course, if you were a Puritan, you wouldn't want anybody to be having any fun, not even in heaven. But gay marriage, abortion, contraception, stem cell research, these are the hot button issues. But there are dozens of ethical values about how we treat our planet, our planet Earth, about whether big corporations are truthful in their advertising, about whether top executives are overpaid, about whether the media present news fairly, about whether the government can hide from public scrutiny, about how we treat our elderly in nursing homes, and so on, and about money in elections, and about why so many Americans are in prisons. These are ethical values I don't hear the Christian right talking about. I do not think that faith-based government deals with these practical issues. It is a lousy substitute to have some faith-based, uh, some faith belief take over from the pragmatic issues that we as a society have to deal with, to work out, and to resolve for programs that work, even without prayer. We can, get, we can let godliness come after decent health care. I do recall one of those signs in front of a church that was intending to be inspirational. It said, this church is not full of hypocrites. There's always room for one more. <laughs> Sexual stuff was obviously a big mistake in evolution. If sexual organs were in our elbows, morality would be quite different. Where they are has contributed to dirtiness and notions about sin. Or maybe God was simply playing a practical joke. I'm not a fan of original sin, mostly because I find it very difficult to be original in this area. Sin has been popular for a thousand years, but I don't want to plagiarize. And in terms of gay marriage, I note that acceptance of homosexuals and legalization of marijuana have come about at about the same time. In Leviticus, it says that gays should be stoned. Obviously, there was no translation. This audience is pretty quick on the draw.
one neat thing about gay acceptance it is, is that it has dethroned the Bible. It turns out that people care much more for fairness and love than they do about Nazi words written 2,000 years ago by a bunch of goat herders in constant conflict over land and whose priests or priest kings were fighting endless wars to be in control of somebody else's land. A god had little to do with any of this. The anti-gay forces thought they had a winning strategy by quoting the Bible, particularly Le Leviticus, and the Bible lost. There was a wonderful young man who do, doing a bar mitzvah, I think in Chicago, who talked about traditional marriage, and after her studying, his studying of the Torah, decided that traditional marriage was completely nuts in terms of what the, uh, the Christian right was saying, because the traditional marriage for, uh, consisted of arranged marriages, and the sisters Leah and Rachel, for example, had no say in her marriages. Like, it was more like a business deal to be marrying Jacob and being tricked. And Jacob had to marry the two sisters who were his first cousins. And these were women who were essentially chattel, forced to marry, and forced to marry your father-in-law in case his wife died. I mean, marriage was more of a man owning women in the old days. So the, de the definition of traditional marriage is nothing like what people think it is today. The Old Testament had, has lots of fire and brimstone and stuff about stoning people and acceptable practices for beating your wife. Aren't they, are these not antiquated uh, completely? The whole notion of romantic marriage is pretty much a 19th century invention. It is quite a nice invention, but it is certainly not biblical. Well, the United States has had periods of religious fervor before. Historians describe these as the Great Awakenings, and the first Great Awakening was before the War for Independence roughly 1730 to 1770. And interestingly enough, this period of religious fervor did not extend to giving us a religiously based constitution. The second great awakening was in the middle of the 19th century, where a lot of utopian societies like Shakers and new sects like Mormons and Christian scientists uh, arose. And the period of many other things happened in that time. But it ended after the Civil War, and it was only then that a, an agreement was made between Abraham Lincoln and some of the um, leaders of the <coughs> religious fervor, uh, they came to an agreement that allowed to put in godly trust on our coins. And uh, it was only in 1870, this is an interesting point, it's only in 1870 that Christmas was made a national holiday. So I guess that before that time, the war on Christmas had been complete. <laughs> in fact, Christmas was treated like any other day. Uh, time. And for those of you who are, in, who are concerned about war on Christmas, um, I think you should have all taken this advice that I saw on the internet, that um, the war, this is an excellent time to renew the war on Christmas. We should attack when they're not looking. <laughs> <clears throat> well, there was a third great awakening, that we are now in the midst of a fourth awakening, a time when religious fervor and a God says attitude permeates our politics. It is not an awakening, of course. It is a great darkening. But it will end. And these religious fervors uh, are really about power. In every age, some churches and some preachers have tried to capture the power of government to promote their faith agendas. Churches use the Inquisition to suppress new ideas like Galileo's. Church establishments use their power to oppose the germ theory of disease. Church establishments use their power to prohibit birth control. Church establishments use their power to oppose women getting a right to vote. Having a personal religious faith is quite different from imposing your religious beliefs on others. A God view is frequently used by political scoundrels to advance their own self-interest. Faith believers and churches have always attempted to gain temporal power, promising heaven in return for tithing and lip service. I think our First Amendment and the Founding Fathers recognized how preachers and priests and politicians would try to win power by playing on public displays of piety. This is what separation of church and state means to me. It is a separation of the function of government from the hypocrisy of public piety. Whatever faith belief one has, it is a personal matter, and not to be established to make one God, one God view look superior. Politically, religious displays are a kind of spiritual taxation. In what way is it part of the business of government for a town council to have a prayer? In what way is it part of the people's business to select one particular God, one religious tradition, for an act of worship? Prayer at town at, at town council meetings seems to be often like a magical incantation, almost like from a, win, a, win, a witch doctor, a superstition that if we have these prayers, we'll have God's blessing on us, and suddenly all the uh, problems in Greece will go away. Secular means the government works for the people without regard to faith. It means government is neutral with regard to private beliefs. 
Secular means neither pro-God beliefs nor anti-God. The alternative, of course, is a Christian or Sharia-type government ruled by clerics. Well, our Constitution prohibits such religious law. It is secular, it is neutral, and that is why separation of church and state is vitally important. <clears throat> One of the neat things about my interest in science is that science works whether you believe in it or not. There actually are only four fundamental forces in nature that have been discovered by physicists. Gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. Prayer is not a force, and there is no known case of prayer overriding or upsetting any of these forces. I oppose the notion of miracles. I think magical thinking is not good for individuals or society, and a god of willy-nilly interventions is not trustworthy in the least. Monotheism is often said to represent an advancement in civilized beliefs. I am skeptical. In the old days, you could complain directly to the rain god, the storm god, the fertility god. Nowadays, you have to get a god to rearrange the entire universe to get your prayers answered over a merely local dispute. <laughs> Some say, unless we have public prayers, there will be no morality, no civilization, and the jungle will take over. Many opponents to separation of church and state actually say this. Well, I will concede that since the end of Bible reading in the, in the schools, we have had hurricanes, tornadoes, and blizzards. And now, of course, even Obamacare. <laughs> there is a view that we in the United States are more chosen than others. This view is represented by under God and God we trust. There is a viewpoint that without God, we are doomed. Without a particular God belief, life is meaningless, and the country will go to hell in a handbasket. Well, I've always been puzzled by these predictions of God's displeasure and wrath. You know that God punishes an unrighteous nation, and he desires to exact a, collect a collective punishment on all of us. Well, unfortunately, this collective punishment didn't come, was visited on all of us Americans. Bush got made president. <laughs> I do not wholly believe in freedom of religion. I agree that everyone has a right to, to believe in unicorns, UFOs, leprechauns, fairies, poltergeists, Venusians, all to their heart's content, or, or whatever else you may dream of in the dark of the night. But you do not have a right to hold a prayer meeting in the middle of a freeway. You do not have a, a religious right to offer up animal <coughs> sacrifices, to withhold medical care from your child, no matter what your religious beliefs. Religious conscience does not permit any group to violate child labor laws or to prevent women from getting reproductive health care. This is not religious freedom, this is religious control and an attempt for religions to seize power. And if we do not have separation of church and state, what are the alternatives? Will it mean that certain powerful religious leaders will be in control of our government? Do we really want some preachers or popes or mullahs to be running the country? I'm equally against Sharia law and Christian law. We know that church-oriented political types are good at stirring up emotions. The obvious problem is whose doctrinal purity is to be accepted? Which preacher will win? We know the phrase culture wars now. We have to wonder how much worse could it come. And many claim to know God's truth, and of course they claim to have a special connection to their God. But even Google and Twitter don't seem to have God's email address. I mean, if you're looking for omnipresence and omnipotence, how much closer can you get? Well, Facebook might be the answer. There are more believers in social media than those who believe in God's word. The notions of godliness and righteousness have always perturbed me. Abortion is called a sin because a mysterious soul is said to be implanted. And we know that miscarriages occur <coughs> routinely. So obviously God has aborted 1,000 times more fetuses than all the physicians combined have ever done. And then, of course, in Noah's flood, there were zillions of unborn fetuses and souls and wombs and many more innocent babies killed. The righteousness of this confuses me no end. But pro-life folks find ways of compartmentalization. And then there's the whole business of apologetics, which means that you can twist and turn and spin and parse every phrase of the Bible to turn it around to what you want it to be. So I say that the government should not rely on magical thinking or superstitions and prayers. And it does religion no good to be divorced from reality. There is a viewpoint that Bible truths are superior to all other views. There is a biology textbook that is used by homeschoolers that actually begins its first sentences. If the Bible says it is so, it is true. If man says it is so, it may or may not be true. Whenever man or science says anything that conflicts with the Bible, it is not true. What a bloody arrogance. <laughs> no one know, really knows what the Bible really says. It was not written in English, and many translations differ. The King James Version, of course, has many errors and in political insertions. 
The preamble, actually, and this is hard to find nowadays because it's censored away, but the preamble actually begins to attack popish persons, and popish persons as a man of sin. The first translator of the Bible into English, Tyndall, was actually burnt at the stake in Switzerland after being tricked into being assured of safe passage. I do recall some benighted congresswoman from Texas who assured us that if English was good enough for Jesus, it is good enough for me. <laughs> you laugh. She sits on the House Science Committee. People ask me if I'm an atheist. Well, yes, I am. I'm a secular humanist. That is, I believe that government is best that has religion least. I totally reject the notion that there is some god or divine divinity that interferes in human affairs that has ever altered the laws of physics or biology in answer to someone's prayer or birth offering sacrifice. I am actually totally unworried about God or gods. There have been so many over, this, over time, it would be difficult to choose any, only one to worship. It is not clear to me why a god would want to be worshipped by mere mortals in any case, or what worship means, really. So my answer is that there is nothing in my life experiences, nothing in my understanding of natural processes, that requires a god to explain it. A supernatural something? Supernatural? Well, I think natural is neat enough. And the phrase, God did it, that God works in mysterious ways, is particularly silly, because it explains everything, and therefore it explains nothing at all. If God intervenes willy-nilly to make things happen, what is the point of trying to understand, to take responsibility, to anticipate consequences and cause and effect? We can, of course, appreciate the emergence of some new gods, like the flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> I am somewhat inclined to the pastafarian movement, especially when I am hungry. <laughs> However, like in all these metaphysical perambulations, I get lost among, amongst the manicotti and the rigatoni. <laughs> the best thing I have come to think is not to listen to preachers or voices in your head. And atheism is not a religion. I have an essay about that, but the essence of it is that not collecting stamps is not a hobby. <laughs> and Bill Maher pointed out that uh, abstinence is not a sexual position. <laughs> and to my atheist friends, I urge that non-belief is a personal outlook, and a good one, but it is not sufficient. Separation of church and state is broader and deeper because it's significant for social and public policy. Without separation of church and state, atheists and all of us are in great danger from fundamentalists. There is little difference, of course, between Islamic jihadists and Christian evangelical dominionists. So I have been concerned that many atheists and agnostics and whatever have embraced non-belief as a personal outlook, but do not connect that perspective with commitment to separation of church and state. Well, what is the state of our union for separation of church and state? I think it's rather mixed with both good and worrisome aspects. It is hardly profound to say that our nation is very polarized and there are strong forces allied to insert religion, particularly certain evangelical notions, into the government that is, by the Christian Dominionist movement. And there's an idiot named David Barton, one of the more despicable people I know. He uh, works on, he's a member, participates on Focus on the Family, he gets support from Heritage Foundation, and he's part of an organization called Wall, Wall Builders. And they are making a very serious effort to redefine history, and they make up quotes from the founding fathers. For example, David Barton would uh, look for some letters and words from George Washington, he would take two words from this sentence, a verb here, take another paragraph, and suddenly you have a statement that he attributes to George Washington, I believe the Christian church to be the foundation of our government. Well, George Washington never said any or wrote, said or wrote any such thing at all. So every time you see one of these, these quotations nowadays, you have to double check with some reputable authority to find out whether they're true or not, and a lot of them are circulated, particularly in emails you get from uh, some of the or strange friends, <laughs> should not be taken at face value at all. <clears throat> Separation of church and state has had some successes, thanks to American United and others, but also setbacks, and it faces several new threats. There are constant displays of public piety, constant calls for some god to bless us and help us out. These are beliefs in magical thinking, that intervention of saints, angels, fairies, cherubim, seraphim, or other invisible entities will step in, but I am doubtful that any of these will do anything useful. But polls show that disbelief is growing rapidly. Maybe it's the most rapidly growing religious movement in the United States. Um, respectable polls like the Pew Foundation show that 15 to 20 percent of Americans um, uh, now uh, identify as being non-theists, atheists, or agnostics. 
And on some college campuses, there are even 30% of students who are putting down for the religious affiliation none. This group has now been called the non stuff and oh, not the, the you. But 30%, uh, or 20% of American, that means of 40 to 50 million of us fall in this category of being non, non-churched. And we vote, but we are not yet seen as a voting bloc. And that's something that I want very much to, to see changed. Um, so overt religious activities in schools, public schools have diminished. A stern letter from the ACLU, Freedom from Religion Foundation, or Americans United often resolves some of these issues. That tactic was tried, of course, in Greece, but it didn't work there because they decided to challenge it. So the, uh, the growth of the American, American Atheists, the American Humanist Association, Freedom from Religion Foundation, Secular Student Alliance, there's a group um, called the Military Religious Freedom run by a man named Mikey Weinstein, who's been, done a marvelous job in attacking some of the evangelical Christian um, proselytization taking place, particularly in the Air Force, but elsewhere in the military. So all these are, are good signs of a vibrant and growing uh, non-believer, uh, non-theistic society, uh, groups. There's a very important organization known as the Secular Coalition for America. And the Secular Coalition represents um, and several of these organizations, like American Atheists, American Humanists, Freedom from Religion Foundation, Secular Student Alliance, not the AU, um, and, and But the Secular, Co- Secular Coalition now has hired a full-time lobbyist. <coughs> she resides at Edwina Rogers, she resides in Washington, D.C., and she goes around with her team and staff to actually lobby before Congress, Senate, congressmen and senators uh, about things that are important to non-believers. This is the first time in history we non, uh, non-theists have had such a lobbyist on our side. And the Secular Coalition is doing a good job in trying to um, encourage um, political packs and um, money that can flow in to support um, candidates who recognize and respect the non-theist part of their population. It'd be wonderful, you know, uh, Politicians cater to the Catholic vote, the evangelical vote, the Jewish vote. I'd like to be catered to now and again. But still, if you add up all the numbers, members of the Unitarian Universalist churches, Jewish synagogues, American humanists, freedom from religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we come to fewer than one million. And we have to think what are our, our total budgets. What's up, what are we up against? Well, the Jerry Falwell Ministries, Liberty University, they had revenue in 19, uh, two years ago of 522,784,000 and change. 522 million to Jerry Falwell Ministries. Mm-hmm. Pat Robertson of Regent University, revenue of $434 million. Focus on the family, <clears throat> $104 million. Even the small fry, like the American Family Association, have revenues of $17 million. The Family Research Council, the uh, Family Research Council, $14 million. <clears throat> it makes me imagine that lots of Romans must have fought so many hypocrites, so few lions. But we have to think of the organization called the National Center for Science Education, a really excellent group that does a marvelous job of fighting for evolution and keeping creationism and intelligent design out of the schools. The National Center for NCSE works with a budget of only $900,000 a year, by comparison to other groups with $522 million and $104 million. Well, from a democracy and civil liberties viewpoint, Religious officials and promoters are not elected. We have to remember they take no oath of office for the Constitution. They do not have to account for their money. And we have to remember that they've always tried to capture the power of government to promote their self-interest and their agendas. And of course, to get rich. <clears throat> so these non-elected folks do not care about a really good government. They want to control and have power over government for their own objectives. And we know they get tax exemptions. After thinking about it, I am willing to end all tax exemptions for all churches. And this notion that's uh, been promoted recently about sincerely held religious beliefs that essentially allow you to uh, disobey any law you like as long as you have a severely um, sincere um, religious belief. I mean, I have a religious belief that red lights are actually an act of Satan and demonic, and I won't obey them. It's a religious belief sincerely held, um, particularly if I'm talking to a policeman. So this is a very, very slippery slope, and I think it's a very disastrous thing that the Hobby Lobby and the Catholic Bishops Association have promoted this, and it might be accepted by the Supreme Court. That is really horrible. So this constant effort of chipping away and changing the courts shows that the theocratic forces are very powerful and they have taken a very long-range strategy, and unfortunately, they've been largely successful. The Supreme Court is now best understood as the extreme court, one wrote, one person wrote. 
And one big reason uh, why is that six out of the nine justices are Catholic. We should be forthright about this. It's the most unbalanced court in our recent history. Now, of course, if you go back 100 years, it's 100% Protestant, but uh, it, why, uh, six out of nine seems, seems too much. I want to give a particular recognition for, for a project called Why Courts Matter. It's at the initiative of the National Council for Jewish Women and is supported by the organization People for the American Way. Why Courts Matter is uh, attempting to bring focus on the, uh, the process of getting justices appointed, both to the minor courts at the district court level and the appellate courts, as well as, of course, to the Supreme Court. And there's a huge dearth in liberal judges and uh, justices have been appointed to these courts. And therefore, they have been captured by the religious right. And that's where we have Alito and Roberts moved up from the D.C. Circuit Court into the Supreme Court, elevated the Supreme Court, and that's why we've got such an unbalanced, uh, ultra-conservative court. We have to work on getting good judges appointed at the lower court levels, and that's uh, absolutely essential. <clears throat> so um, I urge you to um, go to Google and type in Why Courts Matter or the National Council for Jewish Women. Um, yeah, it's a, they're doing an excellent job. Well, I think I'm confident that we the people is a beautiful and an enduring idea. The Constitution, of course, was made for we the people. It was not made for deities. It is up to us humans to cherish and defend it. I'm quite confident that the various gods can fend for themselves quite well without help from hairless apes. The fundamentalist, absolutist way of thinking is one of the great threats to civil liberties and religious freedom. The, 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 the fundamentalist view is that it is the purpose of government to serve religion, their religion, of course. I believe we should have secular government and, that sec and secular education, that is, education that is free not only of sectarianism, but free of all religious doctrine. We can, we, and of course, uh, we can, of course, and we should teach about religion. I often hear evangelicals and bishops fulminate against the secular public schools. I'm pretty sure I know what they mean. They mean that their idea of God and their social agenda is not being promoted. However, I would like to remind them that airplanes do not stay aloft because of prayer. They fly because of good old secular aeronautic engineering. And the 700 Club is broadcast not by God, but as a result of good secular physics and a good bit of secular money raising. <laughs> well, I've had the good fortune to have had a wonderful life. I've been to expeditions to Antarctica and to the north and near the North Pole, worked in Greenland, Canadian Arctic, and I've climbed mountains in the Himalayas and the Rockies and the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I love glaciers, and I weep when our polar regions are decaying due to global warming. I did some physics at the university, and university research in government laboratories and related to nuclear waste disposal, and I worked on MRI systems, and I lived in Switzerland for two years, and everyone should have the experience of seeing our country from abroad. And everywhere I have gone, I am impressed that a God, a God concept is unnecessary. Nothing I have experienced in life has ever indicated that a supernatural God was involved, either in science or in my personal musings, feelings, and thoughts. So I leave three thoughts. Nothing I ever did in my life was by me alone, and so it is for all of us. We gain our individual strengths from our collective strengths. Without the ACLU and my parents, teachers, and friends, our family would not have the accomplishment, uh, accomplished the milestone that we have celebrated in 1963. And sometimes, of course, you are just lucky. Joining and supporting is not for warm and fuzzies. Organizations like Americans United amplify our individual voices. There really are only four forces in nature, known. Spirituality and prayer are not one of them, and nothing in the Bible helps us. There are no super supernatural interventions in human affairs, so it is up to us to sort things out. Neither the Bible nor the Koran provide any, any guidance to our modern <clears throat> understandings in mathematics, chemistry, geology, physics, biology, and medicine. The Bible is worthless in terms of real knowledge, and so is the Koran. Ancient texts not only mislead us, but fail in ethical and moral values that we treasure today. Spirituality is a word we hear a lot nowadays, but I do not believe in ghostly spirits, invisible gods, saints, cherubim, poltergeists, and all those main things. Uh, <clears throat> we do have needs as social animals to feel connected and to think and to and be in, in connected ways. There is a place, of course, for celebrations, for rituals, and for expressing our commonalities. And we are tribal animals, of course. It's comfortable to be connected to a group that approves of us. Our tribal inclinations sometimes conf conflict, and we must come to understand how tribal loyalties to a faith belief differ from a common good. 
And thirdly, I think that separation of government policies from religion is a beautiful idea. I believe that separation of church and state is fundamental to both liberal thinking and all civil liberties. It's neat to remember that the word liberal and liberty have the same root. If we do not have separation of church and state, we have to consider the alternatives of what might happen. Popes, priests, preachers, mullahs, and imams, ayatollahs, they take no oath of office, as I said. They're accountable only to, <clears throat> accountable only to God or Shiva or Zeus, leaves open a, wi a wide door to mischief and, <clears throat> and inhuman and inhumane acts. There's a wonderful congressman in Maryland, <clears throat> who, uh, Jeremy Raskin, who was testifying on a bill related to gay rights, <clears throat> and he was challenged by another member of the, con of the Maryland House, and Jeremy Raskin said, I put my hand on the Bible and swore to uphold the Constitution. I did not put my hand on the Constitution and swear to uphold the Bible. So in closing, I want to thank my wonderful partner, Arlene. Her support and encouragement makes me renewed in my support of separation of church and state and humanness. So I thank you all for listening. And I remind you that the, Const the First Amendment provides um, five fundamental freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to assemble, freedom to petition. It does not provide freedom from long-winded speakers. This is an oversight of the economy. <laughs>